Hi, this is Danielle Ames Spivak from the American Friends of the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. Thank you for joining us today. And we're going to start as people join um, in the audience. Uh, but I know everyone's time is really precious. We're thrilled to be launching this new series, Schmuzik. And hopefully this this episode or this meeting and, and future meetings, which we plan to do on a monthly basis, are going to be candid and honest and an interesting behind the scenes look at the Israel Philharmonic and the lives of the extraordinary musicians of the Israel Philharmonic. It's always amazing to see the musicians perform on stage, but this is gonna be an opportunity to hear what goes on, what's involved in the lives of the musicians of the Israel Philharmonic, the programming, and also talk about other subjects that have to do with Israeli culture and music and classical music um, that connect to the work of the IPO. So we have a Q&A feature. Please submit questions. Zach, who's on too, is going to moderate the questions and we're gonna do quite a bit of questions closer to 20 minutes past 12. So um, we want it to be interactive. Join us in the discussion. Um, I, I have to disclose one of our guests today I'm related to, uh, Miriam Steele, Dr. Miriam Steele is my aunt. I'm very proud mm -hmm. and um, you know, I've always admired Miriam and the work that she does and really appreciate so much that you're joining us today to add some uh, nuance to this discussion on life and parenting and adapting to the struggles and trying to figure out the coping mechanisms of this pandemic. Miriam's a professor of clinical psychology at the New School of Social Research in Manhattan. And we're really honored to have two members of the IPO with us today too. Um, it's late in Israel, so thank you for joining us. Um, Michal Mosek and Sharon Cohen. Um, and I'm gonna let the three of you introduce yourselves a little further. Tell us about where you're located right now and you know how you're doing during this time. Miriam, do you wanna start? Sure, so um, I'm right now in Brooklyn, New York um, in my home where I live uh, with my husband, Howard, who is um, Danielle's uncle. Um, and right now we have with us a 22 year old son, our youngest son, Mickey. Um, we did have with us our 26 year old son, Joseph. And uh, in Tribeca, we have our daughter who's 28. Uh, who lives there. Um, so we're doing okay. I spent a lot of time on Zoom from early morning to late at night, um, getting a little stir crazy as this uh, pandemic goes on and on. Um, but for the most part, managing. Thanks, Michal. Where yes, are you hi. right now? Uh, I'm Michal. I'm right now in uh, Ramat Gan, which is a uh, town near Tel Aviv. Uh, it's nine o'clock at night. I have uh, two kids. I have Yatam, who is 10 years old and is getting ready to go to bed. And then Naomi, who is six year old and she's already in bed and a bit upset with mommy, uh, who is not with her and, uh, you know, um, it has been very, very hard eight months already, I think almost. Mm -hmm. Uh, for us, um, not working in the orchestra, of course, and having the kids um, at, at home. Uh, I think they went to school for two months um, during this time. And the rest of half a year is being home and, you know, studying with uh, Zoom. And it's very difficult, especially for Naomi, who started first grade. So. Not so cool, but uh, hopefully um, things will get better now in Israel and we can go back to some kind of, um, what's the word? Forgot. I'm a bit uh, nervous, sorry, speaking in English like that. It's not no, like you're doing so well. So um, yeah, Shabon. 
has it been a while now that you've been in the the Charles Bronfman Auditorium, Hechal Tarbut, or are you able to go if you need to? For uh, it was uh, it was not allowed to go in the last uh, month. Only a few days ago, uh, it's opened again for only for the musicians to come and practice. Uh, people from the outside are not uh, allowed, and uh, I think uh, because. Uh, up till um, a week ago, we were not allowed to go farther than one kilometer from our home, homes, which is uh, two thirds of a mile. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, so, yes. so people who live uh, not nearby the uh, Born Farm Auditorium, sorry, uh, could not go there. Um, but we try to practice at home. Okay, and I want to get into that in a little bit, the practicing yeah, home part, but Sharon, just tell us where you are and a bit about what's going on and how your family's doing. No. Okay, we were having a bit of problems here. Sharon, at the, at, the, at the mute. No, we can't hear you. Okay, so we're gonna try back in a few minutes with Sharon. Um, I want to ask you, you know, this, well, specifically you, Michal, until we get Sharon back. Of course. How has it been with your own music playing? You just mentioned it. You're obviously separated from the normal rehearsal schedule and the normal performance schedule with your fellow musicians. How has it impacted, you know, your uh, own? Well, to be honest, uh, with this crazy time at home and the kids and my husband is working around the clock, so mainly it's me with the kids. It's very, very hard to to practice. And in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, in March, it was even nice to take uh, some time off playing and rest a little bit because we're playing, you know, I'm playing how many years? 34 years already. And it's good to have some time off, but as it continues um, you get out of shape uh, mentally and physically because playing an instrument is a very physical um, thing and but practicing at home by yourself when you don't have the real music making uh, is very difficult because you have nothing to prepare to and no one to play with so it's I try to practice as much as I can and during this time, whenever I had the chance to do a small project, uh, either in the orchestra or outside of the orchestra, I would do that, but it's very, very limited. So basically playing is not something um, that has been taking a place um, in my life uh, as much as it should be. Sure, and will you just take us back a little bit um, to, you know, how obviously this year is um, never happened in this yeah. year. You've had to take I have to break. tell you, I, I'm, I'm, I, I joined the IPO's uh, management uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, I'm, first of all, I'm the first woman ever in the job. So that was quite something. But um, can you do explain, that in this, can you, this, can you explain Paul, what that means that you join the management? I'm not sure if everyone um, participating knows that the orchestra is a cooperative. Yes. So the orchestra is a cooperative. We have um, we have a board that is um, um, above us, but basically the day to day uh, life of the orchestra is being managed by three players from the orchestra with a professional crew of the um, IPO's um, general secretary, Avi Shoshani. Um, we have um, uh, obviously an accountant, um, a PR uh, person, uh, you know, um, this kind of um, uh, assistant. But uh, the three players uh, from the IPO who are being elected every two years, uh, we have the upper, um, uh, what's the word, um, 
we have well, the decision making. I mean, I don't mean yeah, to interrupt you. Only, not only the vision, but the day to day uh, life of the orchestra. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, money, yeah. the money issues, the musical issues, mm -hmm. the um, health of the players, mm -hmm. um, everything that is going on the, in the orchestra um, is going through, through us. Mm -hmm. So it's very challenging it's more, time more now to elected to the role. Yes, we have to get elected every two years. Um, and it's, uh, what can I say? It's been very, very challenging time to be in the orchestra's management uh, in this year. Uh, so Miriam, you know, what's interesting about this discussion is Michal obviously is, is doing the balance, is doing the dance of so many professional women today who are struggling to be with their children at home and making sure they keep up with their studies or try to and figure out how to stay up to date and involved in their own career during an especially challenging year. Um, I heard a quote from Carrie Fisher recently. It, it says, take your broken heart and make it into art. So I'm wondering from you, you know, what can Michal and Sharon, who I think is back now, which is great. So we'll, we'll go back to Sharon in a second. But what can Michal and Sharon and, and everyone who's watching kind of do to maybe use music, use what their strength is and their talent in terms of the musical front um, to be an asset and a catalyst for a good dynamic between parent and child during this time? Um, well, first of all, my, you know, my hat's off to you, uh, Michal and Sharon, for um, all that you do normally and then all that you're doing in this unprecedented time. I think one of the things that we know is that we don't know very much about all of this. You know, we're trying to um, bring different models of um, difficult experiences and see if it fits to this. But this hasn't happened to the world in 100 years. And so we don't know. We, there's so much we don't know. So we're, we're, we're trying to you know, think of, of different contexts, um, times of war, times of um, uh, natural disasters, all kinds of other stressors that come upon us from the outside. And so I think one of the important things is thinking about the starting point and that no matter how difficult this all feels and how very unusual it is, the starting point with which you brought your family into this challenging situation really counts for a lot. And that um, somewhere to keep kind of a, that steady focus with the, you know, your eye on the ball, that um, you are coming in with some strengths. Um, I'm, you know, I'm assuming um, those, uh, you know, that you are both there with uh, your children for extended periods of time. And that not that this won't have an impact, but that overall the resilience and capacity to adapt will um, get everybody through this. And that um, needing to look at both what, what does resilience mean in this kind of context? And then especially, I've been struck since I was asked to do this on thinking about the role of music and uh, the ways in which you know, music naturally has um, a way of bringing th people together. Uh, it's a way of expressing emotion from one person to the other, but it's very much a co-created space. So one of the things I was also interested in was, was thinking about what it is you might be doing with your children at home musically, what it is that the uh, Israel Philharmonic could perhaps offer as an in-between space for parents um, and children to get together um, and launch them perhaps in a new direction in actually appreciating music and, um, and the arts. But I think that one of the bottom lines is um, there's a very famous uh, British pediatrician psychoanalyst, Donald Winnicott, who um, had as one of his main um, quotes is that what we're striving for is not perfect parenting. What we're striving for is only good enough. And that actually, if you are good enough, your children have a better outcome than if you actually are attuned to them 100% of the time, which is not really possible anyways. But that we learn so much more from those times when there is a bit of a rupture, when you're at you know, the end of the day and this one wants one thing and the other one wants something else, um, waiting is, is not a bad thing to learn. Patience, uh, delaying the gratification, it's all you know, building resilience, um, which is not um, a trait. We're not born with it or not born with it. It comes about from the kinds of experiences we have 
And the most experiences that children have that we all had in our own history is the relationship with our caregivers. What, what's the main tenor, uh, pardon the pun, um, in the home? Um, what are the kinds of ways in which, you know, when a child gets upset, what happens in relation to that? As well as, you know, music being able to be that place that one could find joy um, from both parts. So um, that's my opening comment. So, no, I, so we're going to dive into that a little bit more, but now that we have Sharon back, just tell us where you are right now, Sharon, and how your family's doing. Sure, I just want to check that everyone can hear me. Yes. yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Thankfully, my husband is an IT manager, so he helped me pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> um, so my name is Sharon. I am a uh, mother of a two and a half year old. And um, I live very, very close to the Bronfman Auditorium in Tel Aviv. So it's actually within my one kilometer, um, but I still couldn't use it during this time. And um, I actually wanna dive right into something you said, Miriam, because it really resonated with me and uh, share the experience that um, something that's been very hard on my child, his name is Geva, was uh, sleep. He, he really struggles with sleep. And, you know, everybody has their own idea on what might be the issue. And we had at least a million different comments and ideas on what we should be doing for him to be able to let go and enjoy sleep. Um, and, what we discovered during this time is that he just needed us to be at home because for the first time after two years, he finally, uh, and he actually just started speaking little sentences when um, everything started. And what he would say all day was mommy and daddy together. And we were never together at home. My, my husband works in an office um, until the evening and then I leave for a concert. So, uh, he was just in awe of that for the first month or so. That's all he would say. And then uh, he started sleeping. And for us, it's been just a joy um, to be with, to see him being able to let go and to, to give that to him at this time where we can. And of course, this, this time comes with many, many difficulties. Also with uh, has been working at home and all of us, we live in a very, very small space. I mean, um, Tel Aviv apartments are somewhat like, like San Francisco apartments, you know, like there isn't a lot of personal space. Um, but I think we started this time on a very good note and it was a strength for us to, to begin this difficult time uh, together. I think we're hearing that from a lot of families, that mixture of embracing the situation and, and um, you know, telling stories about how they are getting to know their children in some ways for the first time. Um, and, and that's, you know, so yours is a two and a half year old. I, I love that, um, those utterances from his mouth, you know, I guess it was Abba Ve'ima Be'yachad. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, <laughs> mommy and daddy together, but it really conveys a lot of what's going on in, in his mind and trying to come to terms and figure this out, this change this um, transition. So I think with, um, you know, we're hearing a lot of that, that for some families, you know, uh, and I don't believe it's all positive for, for anyone, but the balance between embracing this new um, possibility of spending that kind of time with your child, morning, afternoon, and evening, um, as well as, and it depends on those age of the child. I mean, I think that's the other, the other piece that I think even here with Sharon and Michal, we have quite a range from two and a half and what was in the life experience of the two and a half year old before COVID, and then a six year old who, you know, when you said that six year old is starting school for the first time, you know, whatever our dreams and um, fantasies of what that was gonna be like are now stop. And in so many ways with all of this stop, that's not what you're getting um, to, this, to this new way. And I think we almost have to throw out of the window all of those expectations um, I have a lot of, of a lot of examples from my own work where I would I used to think, oh, that'll never work on Zoom. We can't, you know, we'll have to just stop that activity. And instead of saying, you know what, we don't know. 
we don't know um, what works, what doesn't work, like even this whole platform. I'm not sure if Danielle, maybe Danielle's very creative and might've thought of it before COVID, but you know, the possibilities for us even to all get together across these continents um, are different. So I think that understanding the different developmental um, uh, ages that you're looking at has a huge um, role to play. And that it, you know, but there are challenges. I think trying to get your child in front of the Zoom screen for all day long, um, and and the fears of what what they're missing out on by not having their regular um, access to friends, for example, um, and whether all of the time with parents will make that up or not. But I think with a two and a half year old, um, they must be exactly where they want to be um, in terms of that. I think as well that it's interesting that you mentioned the sleep piece. Because of course, um, if your two and a half year old isn't sleeping, uh, then you're not sleeping either. Um, no, nobody's much. sleeping. <laughs> nobody's sleeping. Nobody's um, sleeping. Uh, but but to understand, I think already conveys you know some of your capacity to be sensitive and responsive as a as a mother to him, in that you understood that sleep was a manifestation, was an example of him telling you uh, in some way that things are not the way they usually are. So any kind of those disruptions or changes, um, being, being alert to that, that he didn't suddenly become the two and a half year old who has trouble sleeping, um, mm -hmm. but that it's a, an expression of reacting to this very crazy situation. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Sharon. No, I think it's, um, it's, it's interesting to me that you're talking about the needs of the, the two-year-old and the six-year-old and the 10-year-old where as um, so much of the time I'm, I'm also thinking about my needs when, I, <laughs> when I'm, you know, the main caregiver of, um, of a child at home and uh, especially as the months go by. But I'm sure we'll touch on that later. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's actually what I wanted to talk about because I keep thinking about as being a parent myself too, the parent, right, is like the conductor. We have to save face. We stand up in front of everyone, in front of the audience, in front of the orchestra. We have to lead the orchestra. We have to, the show must go on even when we'd probably rather it not. Um, so, but what if, you know, what if we're just having a really bad day? What if, we haven't gotten the sleep we needed. We haven't eaten the way we needed to. We haven't had the recharge we needed to. How important is it to always be composed or is it okay for our kids to see us melt down a little bit? So I think that's why that quote of Winnicott's is so helpful <laughs> to go through every single day. But it, you just have to be good enough, you know, that, that nobody is able to function without the sleep, without the food they need, without, uh, you know, a little bit of space um, for themselves. And that depending on how your kind of meltdown uh, gets expressed counts for a lot. So there are many, many families. Um, there was a study that was done 10 days into the um, COVID crisis that already 10 days in, 61% of families said that they're yelling more, that they're um, getting angrier um, with, with their children. Like, that was across the board, you know? So some of that was the beginning of trying to get used to all of this. And then the other thing that they found was, um, there was a study that was done in Italy that showed it's the parents' perception of the stress that um, matters most in terms of how their children um, behave in response to that. So the fact that everybody's stressed, that makes good sense, right? We, that, that this is very, very stressful. We're not meant to live like this, right? Everybody in their own homes and never being in real life with um, people. And there's all kinds of interesting pieces around why Zoom, for example, is so exhausting. You know, there's the bit of delay, you are on um, in a very powerful way, you don't have any chance to kind of look away because then people think you're not interested or you're looking at your phone. There's all kinds of extra burdens on our attention um, with with Zoom. But I think that those meltdowns are letting your child see that you're also a human being. Um, and I think that part is actually really important. Um, I think, uh, you know, trying to minimize the actual outbursts and yelling at them, but right. to let them in on, you know what, this is a crazy situation. And I'm also having a hard time with it, which validates some of their confusion and, and anger as well, instead of keeping it all pristine. Um, and hiding it all behind closed doors or never allowing yourself, that's only gonna guarantee some kind of outburst at some point, because we're, we're made to express our feelings. Well, us uh, being uh, Israelis, 
Sabras? How do you say? Sabras? Yes. Sabras. Yeah. Uh, Sabras. Sabras. I think that um, being more um, outcome and, um, you know, behaving. Outgoing. Outgoing, yeah. Thanks, so. Uh Is a part of, of who we are. So in a, in a, in a, in a way, it's maybe better uh, for our kids to see that we are a uh, can be yeah, but but we express everything out out there uh, even more. I think uh, we're not uh, this kind of uh, very gentle European uh, <laughs> hot in here. Mm -hmm. uh, the political situation in Israel, everything is. So I think the kids are growing uh, into this um, understanding, uh, even in a, in a better way than maybe in other places. Who, that everything is calmer and on a more delicate uh, behavior maybe I'm, I'm not sure but it's a um, theory <laughs> that would be that would be an interesting study to look at you know yeah. kind of global chain differences yeah. you know the families in uh, perhaps Scandinavia who have a, a different kind of uh, relationship to emotions versus Italy versus yes, um, exactly. yeah. And I have to say that uh, we found a way uh, at, at our home um, to have a, a time for ourselves uh, during the, the day. Uh, in the morning, the kids are studying and I'm, I'm here with them, helping them. And then uh, at noon time, um, I allow them to open the screens yes. and watch a little bit. And then I go to my room and close the door and I have an hour and a half for me and then in the afternoon again it's time for a uh, family time uh, if we can we go and meet friends or we go outside and play and if we can't uh, we stay home but we do things together um, which are not studying it's very important i think mm -hmm. to have time with the parents who is who's not um into you know doing what you have to do for school or just to have the fun time and the relaxed time and even doing nothing and getting bored is okay but yes. uh, and yeah exactly and then in the evening you know it's the evening routine which is always can be a bit uh, more stressful <laughs> but um, we do our best and and even so um, um, having a father and a mother Sometimes it helps uh, I, when my husband is at home. <laughs> I tell him, take the kids now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that helps to cope. I think that it sounds wonderful how you've um, come to that kind of routine. And, and one of the things we talk about a lot is, you know, that having a routine is really important, but it has, it can't be rigid. You, you, you can't, um, because then you're going to be asking for, you know, um, some kind of fallout over that, but having flexibility and stability. So in, in some ways, maybe that sounds contradictory, um, but to some degree having things feel stable, but having yeah. that flexibility so that in the afternoon, it's it's time to go out yeah. and, and- And obviously weekends are different because we have the family all together and the time to spend together. And so weekends are always the best time yeah. in the week, I think for all of us. Mm -hmm. We started to get a few questions, um, Michal and Sharon and Miriam. Is it okay if we, with you if Zach gets into them a little bit? Of course. Sure. Great. Well, our first question is directed to everyone. So uh, as musicians and parents, whom you all, you were all parents, what does your family and child's musical life look like? Uh, well, um, my 10 year old is uh, studying trumpet. I'm a French horn player. So um, during the first uh, Cupid, um, Cupid, COVID, sorry, <laughs> uh, period, um, we took a trumpet from uh, the music store and I started teaching him because wow. I can give him the basics. And he was very thrilled with that. And after a month and a half, we, we realized that it's not good for me to be his teacher. So 
we found the teacher and now he's playing the trumpet. And then my six-year-old, she started uh, singing in a chorus right before it mm -hmm. all started because we felt uh, singing is the best way to get to know music because it's, it's so, um, it's, it comes from the body, through the body and you can dance to it and you can move to it and, and it's, it involves other kids as well. So it's not only you practicing by yourself, but uh, she cannot do that now. Um, but they do listen to lots of music, not classical, unfortunately. They love, um, my son is a Beatles fan <laughs> and a Queen fan, and now is uh, into uh, heavier stuff like David Bowie or uh, Pink Floyd. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm happy. And my daughter is unfortunately, she loves pop <laughs> um, and she loves just dance. Uh, but we, we go with it because, you know, music is great, whatever kind of music it is. Um, and so it doesn't matter. And my husband is, um, uh, he's actually a doctor in musicology and education. Um, he gives them the extra music uh, touch uh, in all kinds of very interesting ways, which I cannot do probably. So that's for us. Um, in our family, um, relating to what Michal said, but uh, I mean, my son is much younger and he can't study an instrument yet. Although he would love to. And he also, he told me that his imaginary friend got a cello for his birthday. And also that he, when he grows up, he's gonna be a violin teacher. So that makes me very proud, but also scared and nervous. Um, and he has a little plastic violin that plays by itself and he enjoys it very much. But actually, um, I also, I was, it was, it's hard for, you know, these days for a parent to, to put their child in front of YouTube and knowing it's like not the best thing for the child, but it's also, um, you know, we learned, I'm sure everybody learned during this time that we need our own time the hard way. So um our our child knows that after his nap he's allowed to open the computer and it's his computer time and his computer time is actually um watching little uh, music videos for children and that's his downtime and it's interesting because he doesn't he like he's very particular about the songs he wants to hear and they make him happy um but he, to me, he looks totally zoned out. Like he doesn't dance, he doesn't sing, he doesn't do like the motions that he could do together with the songs that he knows. Um, but he kind of just experiences the music. And sometimes I can put in like a little um, ballet video or a little um, music video that's like a classical music video um, and somehow integrate that into his life because uh, when I was a child, I grew up in Manhattan and we were allowed to watch uh, Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street every day. And then if we wanted extra TV time, my mom would um, pop in a video of a ballet or of an opera. And uh, I really, really respect that. I think that's a wonderful way to introduce children to so many things at once. Like, stories and fancy and music and dance and everything. And so I, I um, you know, everything is so much more accessible these days. So I try to do that slowly. And, and, and I think, I don't know, that's, and that's my way of doing it. And, and my husband, who doesn't listen to classical music, but he listens to, I, um, I don't know, Israeli pop or something, Israeli rock, maybe. Uh, he, um, he likes blasting music in the morning with, with Geva and like they can sing or, and dance around and, and have a fun music time. I think that's lovely too. 
And also Jill, who asked the question, is a very, very dear friend of mine. So hi, Jill. I miss you. Back, what should we, we go into next? So I have uh, another great question here. Uh, it asks, my daughter is a 16-year-old aspiring violinist. Her goal is to attend a top university and study music. Her high school orchestra cannot play together. Summer 2021 music camps may not be in person. College tours and in-person auditions are unclear. And the ability to compete for an opportunity feels stifled. What should I tell her? Wow, it's pass. so rough. Just hang in there and do whatever you can now and just wait for it to, to go away. And because music will always go on, I think. There is no life without music. I cannot see anybody's life without. And then for a professional player, it's very, very difficult, but that's just the reality now, I guess. And does she, does she get the... Um, lessons on Zoom, like violin lessons? Um, that's a question. Sean, do you teach on Zoom? Hopefully, yeah, hopefully she does. I know that um, what I was thinking when I read this question was that uh, oh, she does get lessons on Zoom. That's, that's good. What I was thinking was that at age 16 until about age, sorry to say, 25, most of my playing was alone and just practicing and honing in skills and studying pieces I love and listening to music I love. So um, I think um, combining between listening to orchestra music or sonatas or quartets um, or all of those together and just learning more pieces by ear and uh, practicing the instrument. I think those are the most important things during this time for her um, rather than um, orchestra programs. Like orchestra programs, orchestra summer programs. I, I went until I had my first child. Like that's not a thing that's going to end. And I understand that it's stressful because there's a lot of competition during, like at this age, uh, trying to get into a good school. Um, but I think that's even more a good reason to just use the opportunity that we're at home to practice. She knows how to practice already. And, and she knows you know, what she needs to do to become a better violinist. And as a violinist, I can really say, um, I mean, I never liked practicing. I don't like practicing. I don't like playing by myself. It's not the reason I play music. I love playing with people for people, period. But I had to spend maybe 10 years of playing at least six hours a day, five or six hours every day, at least to to just be good enough for other people to want to play with me. So, or to listen to you. Or to listen to me. <laughs> so that's, so maybe for her, it's really a blessing. If I can just add, um, coming from a slightly different um, place of being somebody at a university and having a lot of students, for example, are now wanting to apply for different programs, that we really acknowledge that everyone is in the same boat. So it's not just, you know, um, your daughter being alone and being the only one that this is happening to, none of the kids are gonna be able to um, join in in the camps and have the same amount of experience of lessons and um, playing in different uh, orchestras or contexts that way. So everybody I think is, is, is really, um, you know, allowing for different um, levels of um, achievement at this point that everybody's in the same boat across the globe. It's not like this one thing happened in, in one place and not the other. So we're cutting a lot of people slack, you know, in universities, we're not asking for the same grades. We're not asking oh, for wow. GREs, all kinds of things. Everything's out the window. Everybody understands that the pressure, the stress and the, the possibilities are just not there in the same way. So it's what, one of the things that's hard is that she's 16 only once in her life, like that, the, you know, the social piece, you know, that nobody's going to ever be able to give back, but she's there together with the global 16 year olds. So I, I think 
thank you, thank you all for your answers. I think we'll do one more question. Um, and that question is, what musical pieces are best for different emotions to help uh, us or our kids process, to help calm down or for catharsis? Wow, that's hard. I think it's a, it's a question that is, I, I cannot answer this question. It's like asking me what kind of food I want to eat now, because um and my mood is you know in sunday when i'm upset i would like to hear said you know does you're from mother symphony and on another day i would like to hear hard rock <laughs> and uh, on a different day i would just you know put on the radio and listen to whatever there is on so um i'm not sure that um you can answer this question just to follow your instincts and look for what is good for you at a, you know, special, especially a time that you need to hear music and relax just to feel it in your body and, and go with it. Um, I have a small suggestion. I, I realized that um, many people listen to music on YouTube and many times when we search for a piece, on YouTube, the first or second uh, um, videos that pop up are maybe not the best recordings of that piece. And it's my opinion, and this is a very private opinion um, that I'm sure every um, musician would agree with. <laughs> but it's, it's my, it, it is my opinion that um, when music is performed extremely well on a high level with wonderful orchestras or musicians, soloists and conductors, uh, it doesn't really matter which piece it is. Like, like you can find yourself in every beautiful performance of music. And I think many times when we listen to a piece and we say, oh, I didn't, I don't like that piece. You know, or even when we listen to an orchestra and conductor, we say, well, I'm not sure I like this conductor. Maybe they didn't have a good day. And maybe the essence of the music didn't pass through because most classical music that survived 300, 200, 100 years is just, um, it, the beauty of it is that it's so versatile. Like Michal said, like in different moments, you wanna hear different pieces, but also in different moments, the same piece can have different meanings. And so I think the key is to find the musicians that you like um, rather than the pieces that you like. And then if you find someone that you like, just listen to their recordings. They're probably gonna be like, unless they maybe didn't have a good day, which is, you know, normal. Um, it's possibly gonna be, you know, a beautiful experience. Thank you, Sharon and Michal and Miriam. And I'm sure you've le left us all wanting to know more and hear more. And I encourage everyone who um, is listening or watching, please um, email us because we're really interested in knowing what content and what types of discussions, what types of subjects are you interested in hearing from um, the IPO musicians talk about or other experts in uh, musicology or in other um, academic disciplines or other areas of arts and culture and entertainment. So I look forward to seeing you again next month for our next conversation. Um, you can email any ideas you have to events at afipo.org. And um, thank you again to Michal, Sharon, and Miriam for what I thought was a very interesting discussion. It was. Thank you very much. Take care, Take care of yourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Michael. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Zach. Bye, bye. Bye, Dan.